Uh, Mark is from uh, an organization called Nature Paris, <laughs> or something close to that, um, which is a regional agency for nature and biodiversity in Paris. He's going to talk to us today about urbanism, architecture, and biodiversity when nature inspires cities and buildings. And he asks us to um, imagine innovative solutions to preserve or restore biodiversity in cities, focusing on nature-based solutions in the Paris region, showing how local actors are using biodiversity knowledge to design policies of urban planning, architecture, or public space management. Thank you very much, Mark. of the day, <laughs> so I'd like to apologize in, in advance for my accent, I will try my best. And um, so mainstreaming biodiversity into cities is a really big issue. I have learned a lot from urban ecologists in the, in the UK, but in France we're still struggling with this issue. Uh, urban planners or architects are, uh, are still thinking about my neighbor more than green. So it's still a big issue for us. Uh, I'd like to share with you today some examples of uh, some best practices that we see in France in terms of uh, architecture or integ integrating nature into, into cities. Uh, just a quick look at the um, Paris region and some, some facts. So uh, I don't work for the city of Paris itself, but for the Paris province, Paris region. Uh, which is the metropolitan area. Um, in this region, 20% of the population lives, 20% of the French population lives in 2% of the territory. So that's a very dense area. And the urban spaces uh, are 21% of the territories, um, and 16% of, of them are still already. Um, the evolution is interesting to see. Uh, urbanization has declined over the last uh, few years, but it's uh, still continuing, and uh, we are still building mostly on agricultural land, and we, we've lost each, each year uh, almost 500 hectares of farmland. And it's also interesting to, to look at the the effects of this urbanization on biodiversity, on species. I think that's the same trends in the UK as well. Um, what we do in, in Nature Paris, we, we collect data from uh, naturalists, from NGOs, and from citizen science to produce these kind of uh, indicators. And over the last um, 10 years, we noticed that there is a massive decline on birds on different birds, especially specialist birds. And as you can see here, we've lost 23% of birds in urban areas over the last 11 years. Um, it depends the kind of birds you look at, but for example, for the house martin, we've lost um, more than 64% of them over the last 10 years. Um, that's due to the architecture, your buildings are really made of glass, with no place to nest, to rest, to feed. And that's a direct consequence of, uh, of the decline. Other birds are declining, like the house sparrow, but I think you're exper experiencing the same thing in the, in the UK as well. Ecologists don't know very well why the house sparrow is declining. It might be because of food, because they eat the same thing that, that us, too salty, too greasy. <laughs> They struggle to, to reproduce. So uh, we use those indicators to alert uh, elected representatives, to alert uh, people that make the city and to say we need to, to act. There are more positive indicators that we have been producing, and for example, here uh, on urban flora, uh, there is an increase. <coughs> by 92% over the last seven years. Uh, there is more ordinary flora in, in the cities and 
this is a direct consequence of a ban on pesticides in Paris region. Here you, you can see the map of the pesticide used in, uh, in different cities of Paris region. Uh, most of, many of them have stopped using um, those kind of products and there is a direct effect on the vegetation in the cities, uh, on the roads, on the sidewalks uh, and everywhere. So that's a positive effect and it shows us that if we change our practices in the city, there is a reversibility of biodiversity. We can bring back biodiversity by changing our practice. Bringing back uh, nature in, into cities uh, also raises the question of uh, what kind of nature do we want uh, in, in the city. Do we want just green for aesthetical reasons or do we want functional nature? And, and that's quite a big issue for us uh, ecologists. For example, uh, I show you here work of a PhD uh, in, in Paris that worked on uh, beehives in Paris. And it's, uh, the results show that uh, there are more and more beehives that are put in the buildings in, in Paris. And there is a competition with uh, wild pollinators and wild bees. That's, I think you can observe the same things in, in the UK. They observe the same things in Belgium as well. Uh, there's a real competition, so is uh, putting beehives an action, a positive action for nature? Uh, maybe not. Maybe the best way is to restore uh, native habitats for pollinators. Um, we can also take the examples of green roofs or um, gardens. Uh, there is still an aesthetic vision of nature, uh, but not necessarily functional. So we need uh, ecological expertise, experts like you uh, work closer with uh, land planners and with architects to design a vision of nature that is functional. What's interesting with uh, mainstreaming biodiversity into, into the cities is that we can do it at different scales. Uh, of course, the, the biggest scale of uh, urban planning and the local schemes but also at the scale of the suburb, um, for, for example, for the management of the water cycle, for green spaces and vegetation. Of course, for architecture, there is plenty of innovation for architects uh, for integrating nature. And at the scale of the uh, territory, uh, when we consider the footprint uh, of the materials used in, in the construction. And, um, the last decade was the energy and climate decades. Of, uh, I think we almost managed to mainstream energy and climate standards into buildings, but we didn't succeed yet with biodiversity. And here, I think, uh, if we think about the city of the future, I would like to see more and more buildings like this one in, in the right. Uh, that's a building in north of Paris, in the city of uh, uh, rony sous bois uh, where they, they had a quite interesting approach. So here they, they have a, a green roof, but an interesting green roof, what we call here a biodiverse green roof, with uh, more than 10 centimeters of uh, substrate with organic matter. They also use the local plant, native plants mostly, on the, on the green roof. Uh, they have also... Um, worked on a food garden on the roof for uh, children but unfortunately they cannot use the food in the, in the canteen so that's because of sanitary regulations we would like to improve in, in, in that way what's also interesting in, in this building is that they use uh, almost 100% of bio-based materials uh, they use wood, straw bales uh, and also even the painting are made from uh, plants. And that's interesting because they, they meet energy standards. So we could do both energy uh, issues and biodiversity issues in kind of, uh, of buildings. I was saying that we, we need experts in ecology and this uh, ecological expertise is, is essential to design devices for, for biodiversity. Uh, for example, here on the right top hand corner you have a, a picture where an architect uh, um, have, have put um, 
nesting boxes on the facade. Uh, but unfortunately, those uh, nesting boxes are not made for any bird. <laughs> because you know better than me that every bird has its kind of, uh, of nest, nesting box, so we need experts before designing the tools, designing the, the projects. <laughs> on, other, on other examples, it, it works. Uh, down here, um, you have uh, nesting boxes for swifts uh, that were designed on a, on a school. Again, uh, they have been waiting two years before the first swift came uh, on, the, on the nest boxes. Um, but it works, and uh, there are plenty of devices like, like this that, uh, that are working. Uh, another example, the other one is uh, for bats. Uh, when they did a, a thermal refurbishing of the, of the building, uh, they, they took advantage of this to install this new uh, uh, facade. Uh, where the colony of bats uh, can hang on behind the, uh, behind the wood uh, facade. So this time again we can do both for thermal issues and, and biodiversity. Another interesting e example uh, takes place, it's not in Paris region, it's Thousand, it's in Dijon, the city of, of Dijon, uh, where uh, they made uh, uh, an entire wall of um, insect shelters. So that's quite interesting. That's, I think that's beautiful. Uh, for the moment, it doesn't work also. Because <laughs> you, you can see as me that there's, there's no very much habitat for insects around <laughs> for pollinating. So I think we need to, to wait for a, a bit of time to see if it uh, actually works. But uh, that's quite a, an innovation. Uh, Paris City itself uh, have been cal calculating also the, the potential of green roof in the, in the city and it was quite amazing to see that there is more than 40 hectares of roofs available, of flat roofs, more than 200 square meters that are available for greening or for other things. But there's a huge potential also. This is only Paris city, if we consider Paris region, it's maybe more than 100 hectares of roofs available for, for greening. So there is still a, a potential even for renovation uh, on the city. Talking about uh, green roofs, uh, we have this uh, amazing project that were made by Chartier Dalit uh, architects uh, close to, to Paris city, it's in, uh, it's in Boulogne. Uh, it's in a school, again, I don't know why. <laughs> so it's done in a school. Uh, but it's, uh, what's interesting in, in this roof is that they created uh, uh, both a meadow on the roof and a forest. So here it's a particular project um, made of massive concrete, uh, but they use a, a substrate that goes from 30 centimeters on the meadows to 1.5 meters on the forest. Uh, Children can use it, uh, they go for recreation, they go for uh, learning about nature, for doing citizen science. And that's interesting, and one of my colleagues came on that roof and did a, a botanical survey, and she found out that uh, uh, among 114 species surveyed, 44 were planted, but 70 were spontaneous. So this kind of, of device can attract like nature, can be self-sufficient and less managed than other green roofs. So there's a, there's a huge, huge potential for that. And I can mention that the, the Paris region give subsidies for green roof uh, up to 45 euros by square meter. That's quite interesting to incitate. Uh, the wall of this building was made also for, um, for birds. You have here different uh, nesting boxes. Um, at that time, it's still uh, not working <laughs> as well, but we have to wait. <laughs> Another interesting green roof here made of uh, uh, local substrate and, uh, and native, uh, mostly native, uh, native species. And the last work here on, uh, on green roof, uh, um, we often say that a uh, green roof can deliver many ecosystem 
services, but it depends on the, the choice we make for the conception, it depends on the substrate, it depends on the species we use. And that's the work of a PhD, Yann Dusha, uh, who tried different combinations of substrate and different combinations of plants and different depth of the, the substrate. And he showed that uh, we cannot expect every, all the ecosystem services from, from green roof. And in this case, if we uh, want green roofs for water retention in the city, we, we have a water or flood issue, uh, we need to go up to 30 uh, centimeters and we need to choose a special category of plants uh, that are useful for water retention. Same thing for uh, greening walls, there is a huge potential. Uh, I won't be long about walls because of I know you will hear about it uh, uh, today. In the UK, uh, you do very interesting things on green walls. I know my friend Gary Grant works on living walls uh, made of native species that collect rainwater. But in France, we are still doing expensive green walls uh, that are energy consuming, made of mostly exotic species that are water consuming as well. So we have a big road to, to improve about that. At the moment, we uh, mostly encourage uh, low-tech and low-cost devices like climbing plants. They grow by themselves. They don't need much water. They just need that we let the soil uh, perfuse for, for, for them to grow. Uh, with this, uh, it's not a, that easy for us to, to encourage this kind of, uh, of vegetation. You, you see that uh, Often the inhabitants are complaining about uh, nature on the buildings. I don't want bugs in my apartment. That's the kind of thing we, we hear when we're talking about this, uh, this kind of plant. So that there's also for us a big, uh, a big issue about uh, training citizens, about, about making them understand that uh, nature provides a lot of ecosystem services and it's not only Hinduism. Just for the picture, we have many cities today that are uh, depaving uh, public spaces. They are identifying places where they can remove the concrete and grow vegetation. So here it's not in Paris, it's in uh, Le Havre, but many cities in, in France are, are doing this. And that's quite interesting. There is also a big potential of remo removing concrete on, uh, on the city. And I will say a, a last word about um, a study we are carrying out at the, at the moment. So of course the main objective for us is to replace grain infrastructure by grain infrastructure. And uh, in this case you have two examples here of cities that have replaced in all devices for water uh, collection, uh, for water harvest, and uh, that have replaced it by green spaces that are used for collecting water with direct infiltration on, uh, on the soil. Uh, there's also this uh, down here in Sarcel where they uh, delighted um, an old river that was um, underground. Uh, so this kind of, of green infrastructure is really interesting and uh, cities are asking us, okay, this is cool, but what is the cost of it? <coughs> And um, a lot of uh, elected representatives ask for the cost of green infrastructure. So we are currently doing a comparison of the cost of grey infrastructure comparing to green infrastructure. And we are starting to, to have some results. And for example, here in the city of uh, Nantes, we compare the cost of uh, classic devices for water, uh, rainwater, management and ecological devices for water management like rain gardens, like <coughs> pervious soil. Uh, and you can see uh, the costs are in French but you can I think you can understand here that uh, it is really cheaper uh, to uh, to use the the ecological uh, devices and we have the same results on different cities and on different uh, issues like grey roof, like facades, like for grey 
and groundwater management. And we are still uh, carrying on that, that study to give an, another argument for green infrastructure in the, in the city. Well, thank you. <laughs> and uh, we have done a, a little uh, video about uh, what I was talking about, about nature in urbanism, nature in architecture. And uh, you can download it on our website or, or see it on YouTube on all day Thank you. Thank you, Mark. It's not a question. I just want to make the point that London is good at this as well. So <laughs> just around the corner, I know. there's the, the roof gardens in Kensington, 1930, mature trees on there, a wetland. Uh, so we can do it, and we now have 500,000 square meters of green roofs in London since the, uh, the mayor wrote the policy in 2008. So uh, uh, there's a competition between London and Paris to have the most green routes. Uh, we're in front already. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Does anybody else have a challenge or question? <laughs> um, Andrew Waller, ASW Ecology. Um, thank you, Mark. Inspirational talk. Um, I know Paris quite well. I want to ask, um, in regards to a particular bird species, black breast art, um, are we finding that there are enhancements being put in deliberately to help black breast arts, such as green roofs, and how are black breast arts doing in terms of population trends in Paris? Are they increasing, decreasing? Are they responding to enhancements, even general enhancement, enhancements being put in, or foraging, nesting, etc.? Thank you, but I don't know the, this bird in English. I won't be able to tell you if, it, if it's uh, decreasing or increasing in Paris. Uh, I, I would say mostly decreasing in, um, in agricultural land, and we show that because uh, we have removed a lot of hedges and that birds and butterflies are decreasing mostly all of them in agricultural land, but I don't know in urban areas I won't be able to answer precisely. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, Mark. Uh, John O'Boyle from the Northern Ireland Environment Agency. I, uh, I was interest, interested to hear about the pesticide ban because we just brought in a, an All Ireland Pollinator Strategy last year. How did you? How, how did uh, Paris bring that in? Was it legislated for, or how, how did you? How was that introduced? Um, five, five years ago, there was a non-regulatory uh, standard. So I mean, they uh, they signed a, how can I call that? Uh, the Paris province uh, gave a ethic uh, char. How can I say that? <laughs> that uh, yeah, char that encouraged cities to stop pesticides. But uh, one year ago, there was a French regulation, French standard that say no more pesticides on public space, spaces in cities. So now that's the law. But from one year, the cities have started a long before, uh, especially because of, uh, of health and well-being issues in the garden. That was the gardeners that say, we don't want to use any more pesticides. So it's been maybe five, 10 years that they, they have reduced and stopped voluntary and now that, that's the law. But that's a French law, not a regional law. Okay. Well, I think that's a good question. Um, I think that's a good question. Um, I think that's a good question. 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 I think that's a good
Thank you very much.